What's going on, everybody? Welcome. Happy Friday. This is Alone Together Streaming, coming at you live from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, we are just capping off week 26, episode 85. Is this 85, Dave? No, 86, Patrick. This Get is it episode, right. I'm sorry. I'm, it's All the colors are kind of bleeding into one. I cannot believe we are still here doing this. But I want to thank you uh, at home or on your mobile devices for watching us. Welcome us into your... Um, into your world at this. We started this show um, the day the shelter-in-place order came uh, down uh, from the governor of Pennsylvania, and we've been at it ever since, uh, three or four days a week, and uh, we thank you uh, for watching. If this is your first time, welcome, and uh, this might not be what you thought, but uh, we've got a great show for you lined up tonight, so I want you to stick around for it after we take care of a little bit of pieces of housekeeping. We have got John Polano here uh, with us tonight. He's going to be coming on later in the show, coming from Los Angeles. John Polano is a a fantastic playwright, writer, director, actor, a director now, producer. He does it all. Uh, we're going to talk to him about it. You may know him if um, you're fans of Bare Bones Productions, my theater company. John wrote uh, two of the plays that we did uh, in Braddock, uh, Small Engine Repair, which he's just turned into a movie, and the other uh, is Rules of Seconds that we did, that we uh, kind of premiered at the uh, at our new uh, we kind of premiered our new space with lights uh, during that show and of course Natalie Bensavang has got a killer five minutes with this week but before we do that there's a couple of things here um, to talk to you about um, so uh, the COVID numbers uh, in Allegheny County have gone back up from the 50s and 60s we're back up over 100 we are actually at 100 um, so let's let's lock it down everybody remember it is not political uh, to wear a mask um, just keep wearing your masks and those numbers will drop. I know we're not out of hand like some other places, but we've been at a steady streak of around 100, between 150 and 60 uh, for weeks now. And um, the numbers haven't come back from schools being in. I mean, you know what? Um, I mean, you know what Bruce Springsteen says about wearing a mask? Put on a fucking mask. I'm guessing it played. I'm guessing it played. Um, Dave, we're back to that thing where I don't get the, the video. I know. Isn't it fun? Every day is something new. Every, you know every, what I mean? Life every is day, crazy. Every day is something new. But uh, there's a couple of things here to tell you about. Uh, little pieces of housekeeping. You'll see below me trickling across the screen right there. That is our Venmo. 
It's at Together PGH. If you'd like to kick in a couple bucks, if you like what's going on in the show, and even if you don't like what's going on in the show, you just want us to stop, just kick in a couple of bucks. Maybe we will. Um, and nothing's too small. Um, nothing is too large. If you do want to give a large amount, we'll have you on the show as a guest. I mean, we're, 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 we're about that life. That's right. That could be you right there. Um, so um, that's the one thing. The other thing we have going on here is a little thing we call the jag off right now it's the jag off bracket poll brought to you by engine house 25 winery now it is not um, a negative thing it is a term of endearment for us it is all things pittsburgh when the show started there was uh, uh march madness had just been canceled so we decided to come up with our own bracket poll so we're having showdowns here right now so there was a big one last night okay and um, before I tell you about it, I want to tell you about our sponsor of it, Engine House 25 Winery. If you go to eh25.com, you can find out all the information you need. They are located right there in the Strip District, where the Strip District meets Lawrenceville, right in Doughboy Square, 3339 Penn Avenue. Uh, you cannot uh, beat this. The wine is fantastic. Each bottle is a work of art. Uh, it also houses the Clemente Museum, as you can see from some of the labels there. This was uh, this was the Clemente Week here in Major League Baseball. The Pirates had Clemente Day, uh, which happens annually. Um, so get on that. There's about eight or nine different reds that you can get there. The grapes come from everywhere, from Napa, from Chile, all hand um, selected and made into the wine in uh, Engine House 25. And um, if you say that you found out about Engine House 25 from Alone Together Pittsburgh, you receive $5 off per bottle. They also do curbside. You can find out that out on the website. And you can also um, get them to do some free delivery for you if you're in the close Pittsburgh area during the pandemic. So it's cool. Go to eh25.com. Uh, they've got reds. They've got whites. They've got rosé. You can't go wrong. And this weekend, they've got wine slushies to go out of Lola's. So uh, check out eh25.com. So... Without further ado, was one of my personal favorites was in the overnight poll last night in the jag off. One of my personal favorite people and one of my personal favorite Pittsburgh phrases. Dave, tell us what happened because I don't know. Oh my goodness gracious, it's a massacre. Sally Wiggins versus the Dippy Egg was your overnight poll. No S. And let's get into it. Did Sally out yoke the yoke? Did she break the white? Did she twirl? You got nothing else? I got, oh, it's coming, it's coming, baby. Here we go, here we go, and the results. Oh, wrong, wrong results. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> what the hell is this? You didn't have to bring it up. It's okay, think about it. Um, I'm just gonna tell you, Sally Wigan wiped the freaking floor with the egg. That's the thing. She basically walked in in her high heels and stepped on the eyeball of the egg, the yolk, and it exploded. It was disgusting. People gasped, and then everybody bowed down to the champion of Pittsburgh, Sally Wiggins, with an S. So there you go, Patrick. It's another one. It's a bloody one. It's a tough one. Sally Wiggin, she's got your heart. She's got your soul. Don't mess with her. That's all I got. I'll tell you what. Here's to you, Sally. You have just made it to the big, the large Jagoff poll. You are one more win away from making it to the Sweet 16. So uh, congratulations to you, Sally Wigan. And I'm sorry, Dippy Eggs. Uh, you know, there's there's always, um, yeah, there's nothing else. There's no other contest for you. You're, you're, you're just done. It's okay because you're an inanimate object. So anyway, um, that's cool. Um, other things going on here right now. Um, Pete, did you want to pop on and say anything? It's Sally Wiggins and it's Dippy Egg. I just got to get that out there clearly. Sally right Wiggins. It, Sally Wiggins does not have it. There's not an S. It's in just Pittsburgh, Sally Wiggins. In Pittsburgh, she does have an S. Uh, but in, in uh, like on her birth certificate and driver's license, there's no S. But we've given her an honorary S. Now, she's been such a big part of this community for so long that she's now Sally Wiggins, and it's not Dippy Eggs. It's Dippy Egg. Okay. Singular. Doesn't matter okay. how many you have, it's always didn't, just didn't you put, did, like, didn't you put an didn't you put an S on the graphic that you made? I didn't actually I just stole that graphic from Google. Okay. All right. I thought I thought I was like, wow, dude, yeah, you're 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 talking a big game. So so here's the deal, Pete. Um before we get to our, our fantastic guest tonight, um so it, it today is the um uh, 19th anniversary of 9-11. I mean, here we are at September eleventh, and um uh, it, it it got me thinking about some crazy stuff. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if anyone else got pause from this. And I'm not trying to like make make the show heavy here, but it was just kind of like what's happened, um, where we're at since. And then I started comparing, um, you know, what happened in the 
aftermath of 9-11 instantly to what's been happening with COVID. And um, it, 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 it just kind of occurred to me that I was like, okay, so after 9-11 happened, to get on an airplane, you had to take off your shoes. You couldn't have a bottle of water. There was all this extra TSA protections and everything. And 40% of the population didn't say it was a hoax. You know what I mean? So now everyone kind of came together and we're like, okay, we're just going to, this is what, this is what it takes to keep us safe. We're not going to go there again. And now it's like every week it's, it's like a, a couple nine elevens in deaths from COVID and people are still not wanting to wear a mask and not, um, not wanting to do the social distancing. So I don't know. It just, it just kind of, I mean, my mind. well, clearly like when nine eleven happened, like the whole idea of transport, like traveling changed for everyone mm-hmm. immediately. Right. Just like now, you're always thinking about wearing a mask. You're thinking about, I mean, I get paranoid every time I see anyone walking down the street. Handshakes. Right. Oh yeah. That's like when someone tried to give me a handshake a few weeks ago, I was just like, look, that was like, what the fuck is your problem? Right. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, before, yeah, but yeah, go on, go on. But, but yeah. Um, yeah. I, I feel like it's just, it's weird now to go through all of this. And think about 9-11. I do remember where you were when it happened. Yeah, man, I do. I was I was at Pitt and uh, I, I took the bus to school to an early ass class that day. Uh, like the, you know, it's the PAT bus, um, Port Authority Transit, like the public transportation from my house in Bloomfield. And the weird, uh, like I was like, like no one was saying anything. It wasn't like totally everyone knew about it yet because it was like before or during while it was happening. And there was a girl crying on the phone on the bus. There was nobody on the bus except like two people. And, um, the, the girl was like crying on the phone. Like, did you hear, would you believe what they did? And like, and I was like, oh, she got dumped or something, mm-hmm. something weird happened. And, um, then, um, then like I got off and I got home and I had an answering machine, right. With like, you know, numbers on it. And there was like, it was a totally full answering machine. And I couldn't understand a couple of them. People were like freaking out. And then it was my one cousin saying, what the hell happened to your grandmother and my mother, my mother's plane? Because my one cousin had just gotten married on September 9th. Uh, 2001 in New York, right? In Jersey. My father actually had lunch on the Twin Towers on the 10th of September, uh, right? right, Like the day before it happened. So like, so I remember everything about it. I remember that. I remember turning on the TV just as the second tower was coming down and then just kind of being wrapped and wanting to enlist in the armed forces. Yeah. But you didn't? I didn't, no. A lot of my friends did, but uh, I, I, I didn't for whatever reason. I think I, I think I was just confused, but yeah. Wow. I, I, yeah. But yeah, that's so, crazy. Yeah. Like how close, I mean, I think so many people were probably so close to, to that experience because I mean, so many people were affected by it and I don't know. It's just, wild. I remember the skies were totally clear. It was the weirdest thing. I got up the, I, I live right across the street from Tessero's right behind Paul CDs in Bloomfield. And um, I remember there was like nobody on the street. It was the eeriest thing when I got off the bus and then, then after that, it was just kind of like, just a weird, yeah. But anyway, we don't have to make this 9-11 century show, but um, think about it all the time. Right? No, I mean, I think everyone thinks about it when the there are kid, comes they, around, Okay, so but... check this out. There are no kids in high school, unless they were, you know, held back a couple years, that were alive when 9-11 happened right now. So it's like, basically, there's a whole generation right now that's popped up that weren't alive when that happened. Right. So be- before 9-11, for me... I mean, but they're they're living through COVID right now, right. which so is which is which is up. which is <laughs> batshit crazy, right? Right. This is another thing that's not supposed to happen that gener- other generations didn't have to deal with. Everybody kind of gets one. I mean, they, they people talk about like when Kennedy was assassinated or when that, but like I mean, I remember I remember like from childhood like events. I remember Challenger, you know. I remember, I remember that, when Challenger yeah. blew up. I think I was in like first grade or kindergarten, and I remember when um, uh, John Hines uh, his plane crashed. I remember where, like, I was, in, I, I forget, you know, I was in school and they, it came over the loudspeaker. But those were like the, the, the major occurrences. And then, yeah, 9 11, and then now this. I mean, there hardly hasn't been a thing like that. So, and this is something that just keeps going on. And we don't and realize, on, we don't on, realize that we're, we're it's, 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 it's like we're at five or six months. I mean, March 13th, and we knew about this shit in early February. Some people knew about it earlier than February. Well, uh, we, we found we could, out. We could open up that can of worms if you Yeah, so that's, that's later. We, we, got, we, got, we got guests to get to tonight. Hey, but, I just uh, want to say, uh, I, I know we don't get political on the show very often, but like I went for a long walk this afternoon and I actually saw 
multiple, actually more Biden signs than I did Trump signs for the first time in months. So it made me feel a little better about things. I'm still not comfortable with things. People, but... people are people are stealing Biden signs. Did you see this? Um, somebody put uh, somebody started laminating extra additions to the sign, saying, "If you're going to steal this sign again, um, oh yeah, Tom Princess die. Absolutely, that's that was a big one." Um, um, so um, Kurt Cobain. Uh, Kurt, Kurt Cobain, Kurt Cobain was a big one. Yeah, you're absolutely right. These, these are, uh, I mean, Prince a couple years ago, but it wasn't as big as like the Kurt Cobain thing. I guess when you get to a certain age, but like, um, somebody put a laminated thing to the sign, like, okay, you stole my sign twice. Just so you know, from this point on, every time you steal my sign, I'm going to give fifty dollars to Planned Parenthood and buy another sign from the Biden campaign for twenty five dollars. So you're helping those organizations. Thank you. So like, and no one, no one stole their sign for a couple of days. So yes. that's basically what's happening. So. Enough about enough about that. Um, we were talking about Sally Wigan, um, and we also have Steve-O is chiming in here right now. Uh, the man, the myth, the legend of Steve-O Paris. He, Eddie Vedder. I remember he, when Eddie Vedder passed. He, he liked, he liked, just stop it. Eddie Vedder was all over the show last night. We don't need to talk about Eddie Vedder um, ever, ever again on the show. He came up like 37 times yesterday. So Steve-O uh, Paris he said, rules of seconds was insanely good, which I'll, I'll say that. But he also said, there is an S in Jagoff and Wiggins with an S. Okay. Well, I'll tell you one thing. Um, Where's before... the S in Jagoff? Exactly. Exactly, Pete. If you don't know, now you know. So I'm going to say one thing, Dave, um, to, to, to parlay us out of the 9-11 talk and, and bring us back into some guests and our in-show poll. Will I'd you like... sing us some Eddie Vedder, please? <laughs> er... Okay. Dave, sing us Eddie Vedder or... Let um let Sally Wiggins bring us to the next segment. thank you thank you um so now i think um (laughs) sorry (laughs) i wanted to be serious and 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 screw with you a little bit but i i can't that was that was wonderful um so i tell you what to segue us back into 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 the show tonight into into 2020 um i think sally wiggins should send us in uh with a little clip when she was on the show Oh, Wiggins. Is that is that really what you want right now? You want more Wiggins, people? You did not get your fill of Sally Wiggins. God damn. But what do you think Sally Wiggins okay. has to say about that? What's up with that echo? When I walk out and there's someone without a mask and they come too close to me, I, I, I'm just racked with fear and then I want to punch them in the face. Ladies and gentlemen, we got to talk about the in-show jag. We're down with that? Yeah. Yeah, let's do it. Hurry. All right, folks, listen up. There are two music stores on the outskirts of Pittsburgh that any douche with a guitar knows all about. We're talking about Hollywood music. We're talking about pianos and stuff. It's like the Jets and the Sharts. You know what I mean? The Jets, they don't get around with the Sharts. You don't see them driving in cars. Their boyfriends and the girlfriends, they don't hook up. You're either a Hollywood man or a pianos and stuff man. So now it's up for you, you Pittsburgh musicians. Pick your favorite Hollywood music or pianos and stuff. That's your in-show poll. Podcasts, forget you. You got nothing on this. It's only for the viewers right now. Get your votes in. Pianos and stuff versus Hollywood music. That's what we're doing. This one's for Eddie. It's a tough one. Fantastic. I spent a lot of time in pianos and stuff. Got my first guitar there. It's in Blonox. Yeah. My grandparents live there. But I have, I love, I like the rocks a lot too. You know, Hollywood's been there forever and Johnny B. Goods used to be there. That was amazing. And 
the drum world right. is that what it was or the drum doctor all right so 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 well, here's the funny thing we decided we were sitting on this and we wanted to save it for when we had a musical guest on the show and if you'll notice we had some extra banter at the beginning because our musical guest uh unfortunately was not able to come on tonight davu we're going to try to have him on in the, in the coming weeks uh we hope he's okay he had a little thing pop up he's all right uh, we hope, and um, he'll be back soon. But um, get there voting right now if you want to go between those two things. Blonox's own pianos and stuff versus The Rock's own Hollywood. So get on that. Get to voting right now. Uh, only you live can do. We will have the uh, answers for that in about 45 minutes. Um, something else to talk about here real quick. Um, uh, our, our next... Uh, um, okay. Our, 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 other, our other sponsor is... Uh, um, Red Star Roasters. If you go to redstarroasters.com uh, and use the code TOGETHERPGH, you'll receive 10% off your order. Go to redstarroasters.com. Uh, They're the only bird-friendly coffee roaster in the Pittsburgh area, and they now have a new brick-and-mortar location. Find out all about it at redstarroasters.com. So the best coffee around. Um, so without further ado, uh, we've got uh, Natalie Bensavenga has a fantastic five minutes with coming up here right now, and we're going to do something different. We're going to show you a little bit of a, a little bit of a teaser trailer that uh, was put together by the content in her interview. So let's roll that tape, Dave. Tell them I need a break. From this place is pretty murdery to me. It's got a white picket fence and everything. There's like a gay, gay, gay church. You know every horror movie kills a black guy. Alex, Alex, oh sweet, oh. Hey guys, Ruby here. Uh, you may be wondering how a couple like Alex and myself ended up in backwoods farm country. Our home was growing a bit overcrowded. When's the last time we had sex? Well, Cody had it. Thursday at 8 p.m., Friday at 5.15 a.m. and 2 p.m. Is this, uh, Airbnb? Oh, no! I'm never gonna get you that dream home, baby. I think any home you're in is my dream home. <laughs> Marhaba, Emmy. Well, is dad okay? What was that about? My grandpa Norm just passed away, and he left us his farm. What? Well, I don't care if you pack and leave. Oh, God. We'll have farm babies. I always imagine little city babies. What if farm babies are racist? God, that was really racist of you to think a farmer baby would be racist. Hallelujah! The city folk have made it to the country in one piece. Hey! I remember your, um, not that I have any problem with y'all, you know, Muhammad Ali. Has anyone ever told you you look like the guy from the Get Out movie? Ruby! And there comes a time in every couple's life to venture into owning your own home. We're still getting rid of this object up right now. Indiana Jones style, you step off the cliff and the bridge will appear. You chose poorly. If you build it, you will come. That's the wrong movie. Doesn't even apply here. I feel a connection with Starla. A connection? The cow? Cows are like gods to them. I understand it's strictly forbidden for her kind to experience orgasm. I hear men like that believe that the entree isn't as good without something on the side. Good morning. Hi, good morning. Ha! Here's your cash cow, Alex. I'm a winner. Starla's a winner. I could watch those buns exit every day. And the winning cow this year, by unanimous vote, comes from Whispering Mossy Weed Meadows. Uh, it's, it's, it's a beef competition. Alex, no! I, I, I can't kill Starla. You know, I almost became a vegetarian seven times. But you never did. Yeah, but I have it in my heart to even think about it, which means I am sensitive to animal rights. Ruby. First, we got folks moving in from New York, Baghdad, start animal sanctuaries instead of feeding people. Was it your husband that keeps you in chains? It was this one time that we tried, and then he got a cramp, so we just had to do a regular. Oh. You give me life. I know I really sold it today. How are we supposed to make a living off an industry we know nothing about? Hey! Hey, guys! Guys! Y'all are famous! And just like that, we became the proud owners of Whispering Mossy Weed Meadows. I'm glad you're along for the journey. Shukran, viewers. Tomorrow's another new day. This is my life! This is your life! Oh, my God. They're Jewish.
Hey everybody, I'm Natalie Bensavanga, host of Five Minutes With, and this week I am so lucky to have the beautiful and talented Christina Wren. She is an actor, a writer, and a producer, and I met her earlier this year with this amazing project that she did called Hicksters, and I wanted all of you to learn more about it. So thank you so much, Christina, for joining me. Oh, thanks for having me, and thanks for supporting the work. It really, really means the world to me. Oh, it, it was an amazing piece, and I can't wait to tell everybody more about it, but First, I'd love for everybody to learn a little bit more about you. Well, I, um, I'm an, an original Pittsburgh girl. I grew up on the North Side, and um, I did theater and things growing up, um, particularly at, at Perry. I, was, I uh, am an alum of Perry, and so I got into the musical scene there, and we were, um, you know, like public city school kids. We didn't have a huge arts budget, but we all were able to... Um, we just had an amazing little community that all kind of banded together and um, made this little magic enclave for a couple of years. And a bunch of us are still working in the field, which is pretty exciting and are still dear friends. Um, so that's sort of where my, my roots were. And then um, I've, I've since continued to, you know, make, make my own work and I think that that experience of creating our own shows and mm -hmm. being a part of a writer's group that you know would then blend into some of the fall shows that we would do and it just started me off on a path of going yes I'm a performer but I also have these other abilities and I have something to say and there were a few years particularly when I was in college um where I really got into like devised theater and creating work in an ensemble community. Mm -hmm. uh, and then right after graduation, it was an era where people were saying, don't tell anyone you do anything but act. Just shh. like no one will want to hire you as an actor if they think you're going to show up on their set and like tell them how to write their script or how to direct and be, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like, who would do like, uh, okay. That, like, I'm not rude. Um, Right. Well, but, you know, it's like, I can't imagine going and be like, you know what, Mr. Director, um, <laughs> Mrs. Yeah. But so that uh, led you to this project then with Hicksters because yeah. you were able to sort of flex all of those muscles. Yes. And it did. And it, now that's what people want you to do. So it was this mm -hmm. interesting thing that um, for a while I had to kind of keep all the different parts of myself and my work under wraps, but, um, but now thankfully it's seen as an asset and, uh, and it's something I really enjoyed doing. So on Hicksters, I, I, uh, wrote and I produced and I also performed, uh, the role of Ruby. I thought you were yeah. amazing. And for people that might not yeah. know, can you give us like the quick sort of synopsis of it? Yeah, it's, uh, it, there's an urban couple, um, it's a black man and his Arab American wife, and they are like New York hipsters working in the blogging space, and they lose their jobs, life's going crazy, and they inherit a farm. And so they, it's the, the sort of crazy moment in life, big transformation, transition, and all of a sudden they're living in rural America, very much, you know, the others in their community. Mm -hmm but it works, you know, it's like quirky and bumbling and people have to figure each other out and get to know each other, but they learn how to coexist um, and really find peace and, and a new, uh, a new home and, and comfort in their new identity there. So. What I loved about the show was that it wasn't too cynical about the state of humanity. It, it reminded me a little bit of Broad City, a little bit of Parks and Recreation, mm -hmm. where there is this sunny optimism, you know, where these yeah. things are happening, but there's this collective energy of like, this is gonna be okay, things are gonna work out. Is, was that part of the reasoning you wanted to bring this to the table, was this idea of that we yeah. have to be focused on the good? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I knew when I made this that I did not want it to be some heavy, hard hitting drama, um, which I love in a different context, but I, I knew it needed to be light. I wanted us to laugh together. Laughter is healing. It opens up our hearts. Um, and the reality is a lot of our, our cultural exchanges. I'm a mixed kid. My dad's from the Middle East. My mom's from Iowa. My husband is black. He's from Georgia, Mississippi. We met in New York. We lived in LA. So like, I know a lot of different communities and the things that I have found are that I mean, you've got amazing, wonderful people and you got nasty people everywhere, but what happens so much and more now than I've ever seen is that we are being pitted against each other, particularly by our media and 
mm-hmm. you know, all sorts of things. But but we become horrified of mm-hmm. each other, and we become and, and myself included. I can go, oh my gosh, am I allowed to drive through this place? Am I allowed to stop at that rest stop? Is someone gonna hate me or hurt me or mm-hmm. you know? Um, and horrible things happen. I'm not um, denying that, but also a lot of really real lovely human exchange happens and I grew up in that and I've witnessed it and I continue to witness it um, as I travel as I work as I live and I wanted to highlight that part of the story that like this really happens people might have a an awkward first meeting and then and then go oh oh you're great come over for dinner you know or um say like oh gosh are we safe here and then realize that someone's got their back um I think that people when we don't know something we'll stick our feet in our mouths and we'll we'll bumble a little bit but that's different than you know the fear of like extreme aggression and and things like that and so and I think that we we the you know fear breeds anger and all sorts of other really intense reactions and the more we stoke fear the more intense our behavior can become and so you know to me it's important to like you said kind of highlight and embrace the humanity of it and our ability to laugh together and just like just sort of like release for a second and remember that we're all people who do genuinely want similar things for our lives so yeah and I think yeah no and that was my favorite sort of takeaway from the whole show was that there is this sense of community that grows through love and through understanding and through mistakes too. And I think that that's really important that you showcase that, that there's growth, people grow and they change. And Mm -hmm. if you have that open mind, you can find your way forward in a way that is like peaceful, you know? And I just thought it was beautiful, beautiful show, really funny. So if people want to check it out, where can they watch it at? Then go to hickstercomedy.com. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, we're, it's on YouTube. It's free. Anyone can watch it. That was important to us that it was just really easily accessible. So please, yeah, check it out. Share your thoughts. I would love to hear any, anyone's response to it and hear, yeah, whatever conversations come out. Well, it was amazing. And thank you so much for spending about five minutes with me. And in case people yeah. don't know, um, you have a very sort of Pittsburgh famous dad too. You're famous. <laughs> I dad's do. Also Pittsburgh famous. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Yeah. My dad is Salim Gubriel. My maiden name is, uh, Christina Gubriel. So he, um, he's the executive director of the Pittsburgh promise and, uh, has been a community guy in Pittsburgh my whole life. And, um, yeah, I could not, could not be more proud of him and the work that he does. And my mom as well. They're both just incredibly invested in the city of Pittsburgh and, have been their whole lives and continue to be. And I know I, I can't imagine them not until their, you know, very final moments. This is, this is where they have given themselves to it uh, quite fully. It's a beautiful thing. Well, having a mom from Iowa as well, you know, they come from good stock. So you, you're in good. They do. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. That's great. <laughs> well, thank you so much again, Christina. This was so much fun. Thank I hope you. you. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. Good to see you. Good to see you too. All right. <laughs> yeah, she's amazing. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And I, I just the spirit of that show, I thought right now with everything going on, I thought we could all use a little connectivity with some humor and maybe lighten the load a little bit for everybody. It's it is really funny. I've watched the whole series and I'm telling you it's it's really good. She did a great job. I caught a little and uh some friends are in it. Um you know which is great. I saw I saw PJ Gaynard in there and Dave knows him from his pancake days. And um uh I saw uh, Josh Reese was the um the fitness instructor in the first episode. Mr. Okay. GQ Reese who's a, who's a good friend and uh he's he's acted in shows of bare bones and he's like a you know kind of a little bit of Pittsburgh legend in his own right for a young man that he is. Um so yeah, That's so, awesome. that, so there's some really good people in it and uh it looks great. I mean yeah. they shot it's it shot well. It's mm-hmm. it, the production values are great. So um yeah, and obviously the topic and I told you I recognized her. I did a quick little uh little Google search but I was like She's probably the best thing in the new Superman movie. <laughs> I would believe that. I think she is like a, a little rising star, but she's just a huge, she's just Tiny, an awesome a, 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 It's one of those like small cameos. Then like literally everybody, she's the one at the end who kind of like, you'll, you'll, 
you see that movie, you'll know. I mean, nothing against Michael Shannon and the guy who played uh, Superman, but and you know, Kurt, whatever else was in it, but like, um, she she kind of steals uh, a good third of that movie with one with one line and one That's one, awesome. one, one eye roll. So she did a hell of a job. <laughs> but yeah, but uh, but yeah, the, the show's fantastic, and everybody should check it out. Yeah, I agree. Especially like I said. Right now, I think we can all use a little levity, but it also kind of keeps those wheels turning too about recognizing yourself in the other and knowing that we're all in this together and that we all want the same things. And so. it's in a tight little package too. Yeah, yeah. it's They're very digestible episodes. Right. So I really yeah. enjoyed doing it. It was a lot of fun. Okay, so so what else? Now, it's been a week. I, I yeah. saw you make some posts about some Ask Natalie questions. Yes. That have happened. Yes. There, there's one in particular that I'm hoping you want to talk about tonight. The Thropple. The Thropple, <laughs> which sounds like something from like a Seinfeld episode. I know. The Thropple. I know. He I pulled actually the found, Thropple. <laughs> I found a Seinfeld um, Instagram account, account, like what if Seinfeld happened today? And mm -hmm. there's some. There's Was the some Thropple gem. there? There's a Thropple. There's like all kinds of okay. entertaining things. So but right, yeah. tell, like, like, let's tell the people at home what a Thropple yeah. is, and then we'll go into your question, and then we'll, we'll, uh, We'll call so it a week. A throuple sort of is what it sounds like. It's a three couple, like so three people in a couple. So instead of two, which is a couple, three is a throuple. So that's what a throuple is. And this week's question had a lot of people talking and a lot of interesting comments on the post. Um, a guy has a girlfriend and she wrote into me saying that her boyfriend wants to invite this other woman not into bed with them as like a threesome but into the relationship so having two girlfriends and her also being girlfriends with this woman so like a triangle um and she's pansexual three, three. Pan. yes she's pan and the girl's also pansexual which means very sexually fluid and attracted to multiple genders or multiple peoples mm -hmm. And she's not into it. She she she's friendly with this woman, but she doesn't feel connected to her. And she's not interested in being in a throuple. And her boyfriend's putting a lot of pressure on her to do it. And so she asked me what she should do because she's afraid of losing him. So go ahead, Patrick. What no, would no, you no, no, no. What what did you what did you tell her? <laughs> You're like leaning just, in, like, like, tell me more. What'd you tell her, Natalie? <laughs> what was what was your advice? Well, I think there's a little bit of mis there's a little bit of a misnomer when someone identifies as queer or bi or pansexual that it's a free for all, that their sexuality is sort of like, you know, on display, very public, anybody can participate kind of a thing. And no matter how you identify, you're always allowed to set boundaries and no is a complete sentence. And if this woman is not comfortable being in a throuple or bringing another person into the relationship, she's well within her rights to say that and she doesn't need to justify it. And if her boyfriend doesn't like it, she should leave him. Because to me, like if you're manipulating somebody based on their sexuality, what other abusive things are you doing? That's the whole point, man. The free to be you and me thing. Like, okay, yeah. but you know, you've got to, it, it cuts both ways. Exactly. So you can't, yeah. I just don't think people, I, I, I think people just have this idea that, well, if you identify a certain way, you must be okay with anything. And that Absolutely, those things do not correlate at all. No, nobody's okay with anything. Otherwise, no one would leave the house. Exactly. I mean, it's just like it's it's just like you're gonna be walking down the street. Exactly. You okay? You like like, yeah. like it's a whole. It, it's not how it works. Even there's there's no. lots of dating apps, and I'm sure you could find an app for that. But yes. um, but it's it's just not it's just now it works. Yeah. Yeah, so, but you know, it was we're still human. We are still human, and I think we have to respect each other's um, humanity in that regard and and boundaries and space, but. It was interesting because a lot of people um, really came down on the the woman, you know, for not saying, wanting well, to do it for not wanting to do it because it's like, well, if you are going to identify this way, then you should be prepared for what that means. So there's a lot of like shaming going on. That, Ignorance, man. Yeah, yeah well, that I'm just like, I, I'm always that. surprised because I think I live in like this little bubble in my head where I think everybody just respects everybody. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, that's my first mistake. That is a tiny bubble. That's a um, little bubble. That's a little bubble that it's just you in there. It's, just, it's literally just me. I don't, it, really 2020, 2020 is not uh, is not conducive to said bubble. It really like burst that bubble over. Nobody and wants over to again. listen. No. So it's it but, was it was interesting, but um, I'm hopeful yeah. that 
that she follows her instincts because if you don't feel good, and then the other idea of like, you're not even gonna ask if this woman's even interested. He was already kind of like assuming this other person would even want to do it too. So there was a lot of like overstepping on his part. Right. I wasn't right. there for it. Well, all was right. this well, the fall I, I feel well. that Natalie, Natalie, thank you much so much for another great, uh, for a great five minutes with. And um, I, I, in case I didn't tell you guys, Natalie's a nationally syndicated advice columnist. <laughs> and you go to asknatalieadvice at gmail.com. This isn't just people just, you know, just randomly just asking her point. questions. <laughs> But uh, but yeah, th- th- Natalie, great, fantastic five minutes with, and I'm sure a lot of people are going to be watching um, watching Hicksters right now. Too. I hope so. It's All awesome. Right. Everybody should. It's fun. Thanks right, so, so much. Th- thanks, Natalie. We'll see you next week. Oh yeah. Okay. Right, well, all right, ladies and gentlemen, that was another great uh, five minutes with Natalie Betsavenga. So without further ado, I want to bring out our guest. He's been he's been waiting patiently in the wings here right now. Uh, the man, the myth, the legend. He is uh, a fantastic. Uh, I first found out about him because of his playwriting prowess. Um, actually produced two of his shows. I said it earlier in the show, but I've been uh, familiar with him from that. Turns out he's a fantastic actor. Uh, he's also a now film director, and he's going to tell us a little bit about that. Here he is, John Polano. What's up, man? What's up, buddy? How you doing? How that was you? great. Oh, well, I'm glad. I'm glad you stuck around and watched the whole thing. Of course, I, Thropple, uh Never heard of that. That's awesome. Put 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 it in your next screenplay, buddy. <laughs> yeah, I'm in that. Maybe. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Or in your lifestyle. I mean, whatever you want to do. I've gotten worse notes than that. <laughs> Could you work a Thropple in this, John? Yeah. I mean, everything everything's good. I was, so- I was on my way to the office, and I was looking at <laughs> a podcast, and they were talking about Thropples, and I just realized that's the that, that was me being an executive. That's, you looked fantastic. I mean, you look like an executive. I, 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 I couldn't. I couldn't believe that's, it. That's acting. So, so um, before we get into things, how how are things on the West Coast right now? You know, the air quality is definitely a little rough. It feels like you're kind of at a campground, and everyone around you has uh, has a fire um, going on. Uh, you know, we've had these on and off. It's been a couple of years since it's, got, it's been this bad, but you know. It's just, it's like fucking sharks are going to fall out next. You know what I mean? Like everyone, it's 2020, like everything's just the worst. It's just the worst. And, uh, but it sucks. It's got like a, an orange glow to it. Last week it was like 112 at my house. Mm. And this week it's cooler and you're like, it's cooler, but it's cooler because there's a blanket of smoke preventing the sun from heating you up. So yes. that's a silver lining, right? I guess. Yeah, it's a silver lining. <laughs> And you're sitting there. So this is happening. Things are burning. COVID's happening. You've got kids and you're homeschooling them or your, your online classes are happening where you're, you're, yeah. you're youngsters. How, how old how old's your son? Um, I got a five-year-old and a 15-year-old. Five-year-old. Year old is doing quite well. Um, you know, but the, uh, uh, the five-year-old is easy to say having it. Just at that age, I can't even imagine. He like watches it and he'll draw it, and then he'll just be like, "Fuck it," and just <laughs> and we're like, "Come back," and be like, "Nope." And then you're like, "The other day, uh, I wasn't there. My wife was watching. Him. Some kid was like, because you got to mute and unmute. They're always like, you know, the teacher will be like, okay, you know, whatever, unmute it and answer the question. And my wife was like, you know, kind of overseeing it because you stand there with a fucking basket full of the papers like this, and the teacher will be like. Where's the number paper? And you're like, oh my God, here it is. And you give it to them. It's so stressful. So, uh, but she just, some parent was yelling at their kid, like really bad. Oh my God. Like, I mean, you don't blame the parent. They're losing it. They're like, you look at that thing and all this. And, uh, and the teacher was like, okay, everybody calm down. Like, let's just relax. I mean, the te- she is a great teacher and they're all trying to be patient, but it sucks. So, so John, you started out um, as an actor, right? That was your first... That was the first. No, I mean, movie. I started out as a writer. Okay. Um, I took an acting class. I, I moved to LA and I wrote a bunch of just like the worst screenplays ever made, you know. And then um, I was in the mailroom at Castle Rock Entertainment, and I knew the guys in development. I'd, I'd like give them this sh- terrible screenplay I wrote about like you know cowboys and robots or whatever. The fuck. And the coverage they'd get would be like, "Why is a twenty-five-year-old writing this?" Like I was anticipating uh, what kind of you know I was writing. Uh, uh, movies about movies basically mm-hmm. and then i started to take an acting class uh a buddy phil Santani, who i met uh in the mailroom who was like a buddy to this day he was taking this acting class so i started to take it <clears throat> and i was terrified under the pretense of 
you know, a lot of writers do that. And it's, it's just one of those things that's highly recommended. Like when you want to be a, a screenwriter, the two things they say is take an acting class and it'll help you understand that. And then, you know, take an improv class. Both are very invaluable in terms of helping writing theoretically. So I took that, um, I took that class and the window keeps changing. It's just like I'm filling the whole screen. Am I doing that, or are you guys doing? That? No, we're we're doing that. Dave's Dave's I'm trying to look into your beautiful face, and then it disappears. It's like just you got to imagine it's there because everyone wants to see you. I think everyone's seen enough better. of me after 86 episodes. So anyway, I started taking this acting class, and um, yeah, I kind of got bit by the bug. I really I really dug it, and then I started to uh, first and foremost, you you do scenes of plays, mm -hmm. and I had never done. Uh, uh, I'd been to like one play. I never really read plays. I've just been into movies. So that's like the best writing, you know, you do uh, first scene I ever did, I think was like from uh, um, death of a salesman. I played like Biff in that scene when he's with happy or whatever the fuck it was. Be a great. Biff. Great. I mean, I'm sure you played Biff at some point. So, mm -hmm. you, you know, you sit there and the teacher who I like adored and she would be like, look at you and be like, you got to play this scene. So you're like, somebody knows who I am. And I do this. so I just started studying these, these plays and it really kind of opened my my whole mind and, and everything up. And I started to just consume all this theater and started to write monologues and plays, <laughs> little one act plays in class. And um, I met my wife in this class and we started a theater company. So I, I kind of developed my voice as a writer by, you know, having that immediate reaction and, and sort of putting the screenwriting on hold and just writing all these plays and, you know, seeing how they were reacted to in class and then changing it. And then we started to produce First, we did a couple of shows of one act plays, and then I started to write full length plays. But that sort of amplified my progress as a writer by being able to write something, put it on stage, having you know, it's true. The audience tells you more about your your what for me what my writing was more than any notes or friends or whatever ever could. It's an amplified feedback loop. So I started to really figure that, and you know, one of the things. You know, uh, uh, like Stephen King was growing up one of my favorite writers, and one thing he always said is when he writes, he has the ideal reader in, head, in his head, and, and that that process really helped me create my ideal audience in my head, <laughs> which are theater goers, which are smart uh, people who are like ready for a good time and they want their buttons pushed and they really want to go laugh at things they don't usually mm -hmm. laugh at, and you know that the the IQ goes through the roof in those situations. So that 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 was sort of how it became, but then as I was acting and I really loved it to me being on stage, especially, I mean, you know, this, it was like everything I loved about playing organized sports. It was that teamwork and that adrenaline, but amplify because it's your soul up there. And uh, yeah, so that I kind of got bit by that. And then, you know, I was juggling a whole bunch of jobs and my wife and I, you know, she's an actress too. And we were kind of trying to make ends meet. I had so many day jobs, but then I would started to work as an actor in various things and, mm -hmm until the writing kind of sold a couple things and the writing took off to a point that I uh, sort of hit the brakes on acting and all that other shit. A couple about selling a couple of things. I mean, um, some of the, some of the more like national releases, I mean, was that stronger? Is that, the, was that the, 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 more that was the first big thing? I mean, I'd written yeah. other screenplays and that had sold. Other assignments, but that was sort of the big one that really kind of opened, you know, opened up a lot of doors. That was stronger. That was the, about the Boston marathon that starred Mark Wahlberg. Right. <laughs> No, that's Patriots Day. Patriots Day. All right. <laughs> you were fucking with me. I was like, oh. by the way, that's the best acting you've ever done. Uh, no, it's stronger as Jake Gyllenhaal and David Gordon Green. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Dave, Dave pulled up a Mark Wahlberg movie and it was a whole thing. Cause I heard Boston. I heard Boston. I heard Boston. It was... In order to do a movie that takes place in Boston, you have to get Mark Wahlberg to sign off on that. That's what I thought was happening. He's part of the process. And you buy one of those burgers, right? The Yeah. That, that, that's I actually like worked that. with uh, Mark Wahlberg about <clears throat> two years ago. He was awesome. That's 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 what I hear. He he came into he came into right. Pittsburgh to um. Well, it's funny funny sad funny story. Um, I was I was I was shooting a movie and uh, I made uh, my girlfriend then now wife um, come up to state because they put me up in a really cool hotel and I was like oh you got to come up here like this isn't gonna happen again. Right. And um, so she just showed up. She went outside. She smoked cigarettes at the time. She went out and smoked a cigarette. And uh, some guy came up to her and started like kind of like hitting on her in a sense. And she was yeah. like, whatever, dude, whatever, dude. He was like, oh, no, I know you, blah, 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 blah. You got great stuff. Blah, blah. Well, you know my friend Mark. And she's like, hey, Mark, nice to see you, blah, 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 blah. And then they all like kind of like leave. And as she's outside smoking a cigarette, 
she sees that it, like a bunch of people are coming up to get autographs and photographs. And she goes, oh shit, that's Mark Wahlberg. Oh. So she's telling me this after I just shot like a really good day with like big famous people. And I was like, oh. And then everybody in the car ride home was like, what's wrong, Patrick? And I was like, my wife just got hit on by Mark Wahlberg. By the way, she made a terrible decision, obviously. She, a huge, a gigantic I mean, decision. That's all right. So hey. anyway, side note, that was an abbreviated story. So, okay, so so Stronger, Jake Gyllenhaal uh, was a big one. But By the way, uh, you, you have an uh, – I adore your wife. She's remarkable. And, and your daughter, I, I I think you really lucked out in that department. I, I, I don't know how you did that. But every, I, it's, it don't, yeah. don't, don't talk about it. I might jinx it. And hopefully they're not listening right now. Yeah. But um, but yeah, like while while Natalie's segment was going on, that's when the Pepper sighting happened. So uh, like P- Pepper came in for her like nightly diaper change and like kind of like was blowing it up and running around in circles. So the audience and you got to, uh, unfortunately had to miss the uh, the, the the Pepper entrance. Well, we can imagine. I think that's happening a lot nowadays. And yeah, I think at first it was endearing, but I think now it's uh, people are seem to be losing their patience. So so John, at first, you- first couple of weeks it was like, well, you have a dog, and now it's like. You yeah, know. shut that dog. Shut that dog up. Yeah, we're just done. Everyone's done with this shit. So, so you were talking earlier about um, in theater, you put your work on the stage, you have the audience right there. So you wrote a play that I'm I'm extraordinarily fond of called Small Engine Repair, right? Um, it actually was it was the second show we did in Braddock in our in our space oh, nice. in Braddock, and when we did it, we did not have any electricity. Um, we basically had like two plugs to plug things in. It was a couple fluorescent lights. And we just kind of built the set around it um, and, and, and rolled with it. So like there was nothing to it. But the, the, the show that you wrote kind of lent itself to that. And I, I loved the script when I met it, when I read it. Now, you had done this show and essentially workshopped it in a sense. You had run that show for how long did you run it in, in uh, it L.A.? It ran before? in L.A. I mean, I forgot exactly when you did it. It ran in L.A. for about a year because it transferred. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, that's pretty remarkable for L.A. at least. And we started it out as a late night show. My wife produced the time this late night thing at our theater. And it was like, look, you can here's a little bit of a budget. I think it was like like 700 bucks. <laughs> and um, the, they were doing a play called uh, Sunset Limited, Cormac McCarthy play. And it was like you can use their set and their lighting scheme. So basically you had to come up with an idea, either find a play or in this case, you know, watching that play which was a rancid old apartment it was like okay well you can make a machine shop the lighting design you had to use their lighting design so it's lights up there's the play lights down it was very pragmatic for that very minimal sound cues and everything and then you know that sort of was the impetus that's why i think it worked obviously in your sort of yeah we actually used a we had a boom we had a like we had a shop boom box for the pre-show music so all the pre-show music well there's 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 a little piece of the set um that that was before the set there's brennan uh gabe uh gabe king fantastic and that's casey cott who left our show and went on to do rivendale or riverdale right and he was the yeah he was he was doing that so he uh now he doesn't now he doesn't return my phone calls anymore but yeah. uh, we, we, got, we got him ready for his character, though, in that show. No, I remember, what year was that that you did it? Oh, man, um, 2000, I don't know, five years ago, six yeah, years ago? Yeah, yeah. No, I remember yeah. we were communicating right. during that time, and it was really fun, and I really appreciated your sort of feedback on it, which was awesome. And, um, you know, that, that play has gone on. I mean, it's been done all over the world, basically. I mean, I, it, it sort of attracts that sort of grittier smaller theater that may not have a huge budget but like just loves the story it doesn't require a lot of stuff i mean it's prop heavy but you know it's not hard to find items so it's a- so so you ended up kind of taking this piece that you've already you've ran it for a year you played uh you played frank the whole time through for the in LA, yes. uh-huh. okay in la for that whole run so, so you decide to convert it to a screenplay well it went to new york right and i did it in new york so i had kind of lived with it And then, you know, John Bernthal, who was in the cast in L.A., a good buddy of mine, we were always talking about, you know, as our careers took off, it was always like, well, let's do our own, you know, let's make our own thing. And and I, this sort of lent itself to that, you know, smaller budgeted indie thing that um, we could do and that I knew that I could uh, direct it because I just knew the world. And... And I was like, well, should I play this character for, you know, a year and a half of my life? I'm going to kind of stay into it. And, and it was kind of crazy to do that in retrospect, but it really worked. 
really lent itself to the piece. So yeah, we, you know, I, I, I wrote the script and we kind of just had to find a window to do it. And then it happened at the right time um, when we were right. Cause as you know, the script, the, the play is written as if this is a guy who had a, had a child when he was like a senior in high school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was very much like he's, you know, but by the time the movie was made, we're like in our forties so some of the theater, some of the elements from the play uh, had to change, but they kind of, it was just a different animal. It was turning it into the movie version of that story as opposed to the play. So it kind of all worked out for the best uh, until the release of it and then fucking COVID hit. But yeah. But I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm proud of you. You decided to do the Rocky thing. I mean, you did the Stallone Rocky thing. You were just like, screw it. We're going to do this. I'm going to be in this. And you know what? I'll direct it, even though he didn't direct that. But like, well, it, it, look, took, I, it took balls. And I, and I think. Well, I, thanks, man. I, you know, I, I, to me, it was like to take time away from my writing career and from my family and do all this stuff. I was like, it has to be worthwhile. And, and you know, once my sort of screenwriting career started to take over, I just stopped acting. I mean, I, I did, I couldn't audition, I didn't have time. And so I really missed that. So I was like, well, fuck it. If I'm make, taking this dive, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make sure I, uh, you know, really go for it and, and not, not be afraid. And, and, you know, it was terrifying. But then, the, as you know, playing Frank, the, the character lent itself to this because it's a character who is trying to keep his shit together. Deep down is filled with murderous rage but trying to manipulate everything. And I actually think you probably went through something extra similar being playing that role and running your theater company. You know, you're in the scene and you're doing it, but you're also like, Oh shit, that light broke and this and that. And that lends itself to the character because he's, although he's present, he's pulling all the strings. And mm -hmm. I, I just, you know, tried to use all that shit in the performance. And, uh, and, and, you know, I just sat in the character so easily. I don't know if I could ever, I just didn't want to get, let that opportunity go away. Cause Plus, I I'm tell, I'll, I'll tell you right now, there's not an actor on the planet that would have done it the way you did it. And, or the, just not, not only because, I mean, you wrote the thing, you birthed the thing, you know exactly what you want this character to think in every second of it. Like you just said, pulling the strings, you know what's right. happening there. And I think it came, it comes across, but um, I, I think, I don't think you'd have been happy with anybody. Like, no, I mean, I, I kind of knew that. I think, you know, and as an actor, you're innately trying to perform something. I mean, look, there's some great actors out there. No, I'm not um, saying there's not. I'm, other people yeah, have brought I, up I, mean, I, the I table, agree with but... you. I had a very specific idea that I, of what that character should be. And yeah, I, I just was like, fuck it, I'm going to do it. Right. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm super glad I did. I'm really, I'm really happy with how it came out. And and I also knew like, if I didn't have the supporting, you, the play is so much about the camaraderie of these characters, and the movie is too. And you know that. I mean, mm -hmm. like, you do that play, you have a blast, and and it's designed to not be about you, to be about everybody else. I mean, like, all good acting is, but right. particularly the making of the movie, I had surrounded myself with such unbelievable. Talented actor. Now you said John John Bernthal. I mean, who else was who else was in your cast? Uh, Shea okay. Wiggum there. He played okay. uh, he played Packy, who mm -hmm. I kind of knew Shea peripherally, but we became super close during this process. I mean, the, the the movie was very much rehearsed like a play. Like John and Shea and myself sat in uh, in this office when it was first when I first built it for like there you go you know, over a month just doing table work and rewriting the script and doing all that stuff and. You know how it is when you uh, when you shoot movies or TV shows. Sometimes an actor is like going to get a piece of pizza, and you're like talking to the AD. This was not that. It was like every single minute, everybody's there, um, just hanging out. There's no trailers, so everyone was in it, and it really just lent itself to that whole process, which is cool. I mean, it all it all comes across. I'm really excited for people to see this to see this movie. I mean, honestly, um, the the camaraderie with you guys is great. Now, uh, your packy, I. When you said who was cast in it, I was like, I don't know, bro. That's something very different. You know what I mean? That, that's not that's not that's not the way I was thinking it. And it ended up being amazing. Well, look, Shay's a chameleon. I think he typically plays a heavy character. You know, right. like, and uh, he really, you know, not only did he just lose a ton of weight, he found the sort of, I mean, you know, doing the play. Pac, he's sort of a singular creation in the sense of he only kind of exists in the world of this play in in many ways, and and he. It's all about heart. It's all about being, you know, the, the the heart of that character and the sensitivity of him. And he just went all in on that, and it was it was amazing. But again, we're used to seeing Shay and stuff like Boardwalk Empire, 
Perry Mason or whatever, where he's like a badass, you know? Right. But I mean, he's a, a chameleon's the perfect word for it because that's what yeah, I, I mean, uh, that's the tag I'd put on him. Look, everybody loves Shay. Like he, you know, everybody's like whatever. So, so, so you have this. So you, so you bust this thing out in a few weeks, right? You shoot this thing. No, I mean, we had a decent shoot. We had we shot over, you know, uh, you know, four weeks. You know. Four weeks. Okay, I was a week off. A few could be four. <laughs> Sure. But, you know, fine. you want you want to just keep correcting me. That's fine. You want to one up me. I, I'm sorry. I said Mark Wahlberg instead of Jake Gyllenhaal. I'm sorry. Like I shot it on my phone over like two weekends or something. A few is okay. Is do you think a few is three, three or four, or two or three? Is two. a couple two or three? A couple or is a few? two. A couple is two. A couple is two. two, maybe three. Okay. See, I th- I come from three, maybe four. I didn't right. do a lot of research with you on this, man. We had a conversation like a month ago about this. I, I didn't remember. I'm sorry. I didn't. I didn't take. I didn't take notes. This, I'm not. I'm not freaking Barbara Walters here. It's so anyway, right. some some interviewers research, some don't. It's fine. Let's and I'm I'm the latter, and I think everybody knows that. And that's, this is I love this, that about you. You're this, right. that, that, that's what it is. It's it's off the cuff. So uh, speaking of which, okay, so you get this thing after after four plus weeks of grueling filming, um, you. Um, you get this thing edited. You're ready to go. You got a festival lined up, a killer festival. You're about to you're about to showcase this movie, and then COVID hits. Yeah, we like finished color timing the morning that South by was canceled. I mean, the mm-hmm. writing was on the wall, but um, yeah, canceled, and you know, it just all got in the air. A, a lot of films sort of were in that holding pattern, and then yeah, it sucked. <laughs> I mean, some people had it worse. It's, you know, it's a small thing in comparison to a lot of the <laughs> suffering and sacrifices people are being made, but it's, it's, it's not been easy to um, work so hard on something and be so happy with it and just have it not really seen yet. You know, I mean, you're, be- you're, you're, you're sitting on a, like a, you're sitting on some gold here right now. You want to share it. Um, I, I can't right. even imagine what's going through. I want this thing to get released. Um, so, I mean, have you, have you given thought to, um, are you gonna are you gonna hold off until the next the next round of festivals come up, or are you just gonna kind of play it by? Well, your here's head? the thing: is is in the foreseeable future, festivals certainly the type of festival that would be appropriate to launch this thing, which is like a South by. I mean, it's a mm-hmm. you know it's a gritty, challenging, dark movie. It's not you know, <laughs> I, I I love it, but it's to me sort of like this like a Sling Blade, you know, Usual Suspects uh, type of thing. You would see, you know. Uh, those grittier, smaller movies, um, those type of festival. I mean, everything's online. So mm-hmm. for the foreseeable future, I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, it's so confusing because I know some theaters are open. They're not in LA, but I'm hearing other places are, but um, I, you know, I know the team is having these discussions. I know a lot of movies in the same situation as we are, are making that choice. Do you hold out or do you go to a streamer or, or try to get online, which, you know, the silver lining of that is that, so many of us are are home right now mm-hmm. that if some new content comes out, it's going to get a lot of eyeballs on it. But there's also the romanticism of sitting in a theater and having it go. But like, when is that going to happen? I mean, like I, I, there's no crystal ball, but we do know it's not anytime soon. Right. You know, so, uh, so I mean, this isn't, this isn't such a huge budget movie that all the investors are like fire sale, fire sale. But, you know, it's it's a it's a tough decision, and and it's not a world. I mean, I don't work in distribution. I don't I don't know. Right. Well, I tell you what, I am a big fan of small engine repair, and I'm such a big fan. I'm gonna bust this out oh, right yeah. now because uh, because I don't know. I, I haven't I haven't opened this since the closing night of of uh, of small engine repair. So Johnny Blue is uh, is referenced in uh, the thing. John, if you were here right now, I would give you a big. Big old Dude, tumbler of this, I but um, that. but that's also I thought. I thought so I just, you drink it is almost as good. It's uh, good, good. Go on. It's just very smooth. I, I remember that. Uh, you know that that was sort of the holy grail. I always thought of the. I never would have bought it if it wasn't for the show. And so good. It's a blended, and I know a lot of purists don't like blended, but I, I find it sublime. So in the show, it's a key. It's a key moment. It's a key thing in the show. The the Johnny Blue kind of kind of runs around the Johnny Walker Blue label. So I surprised the cast with with a bottle of this on closing night, and literally the characters turned into the characters from the show in the dressing room. Wait, did you have it drink it on set? No, 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 no. I couldn't. I couldn't do that to these guys. 
Uh, we drank beer during the show. We did not yeah. do because we drank a lot. Oh, I know. The show. We did one, when the original production when it was late night, and Bernthal was going to shoot season two of Walking Dead, so he was leaving before his understudy came on. We had a, a, a substance speci- like a uh, real uh, show. Did you do and everything it, real? Everything, and it was. And we were so <laughs> fucked up, and it was. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it was all friends. It was like a late thing. And it, right, it was, but still. It was a disaster. Actually, I'm going to tell you a funny story. Is one night we were doing the show and uh, we lost power. And like before Swaino walks in, right? We lost mm-hmm. power. And it's a, it was a very small theater. It had it only been open for like six weeks, but we had a full house, which was like 60 people or whatever. Okay. So the, it's dark and we're like, shit. And I, you know, I'm, it's my shop. I go over there. I know there's a flashlight there. I'm doing it. And uh, we just kept thinking, somebody's get, like, I can't, I don't go cut, you know, like, we're like, people will tell stop. So we just kept doing the show. And uh, people from the audience started turning on the lights in their phone and lighting us a little bit. And everyone came in. And we had to improv a little bit about, oh, you didn't pay your power bill or whatever. I mean, it was terrible. It was yeah. an awful show. It was terrible. Like, I wish I could tell you, like, the, the, the act. Like magic happened? Magic did not happen. We barely got <laughs> And then our buddy Josh Hellman, who plays who played Chad, shows up and you know late in the play, and he's just he's just been workshopping all these improv lines. So he walks in and he's like, "Hey, what happened to the bill? You didn't pay it. Did the hamster who runs the?" And we're like, "We're just shut looking up. at it. Like, get us fucking through this. Like shut up. <laughs> like just double time." Let's so go. then we did the play, and people are like, "Well, okay." And I mean, like half the people there thought that's the play, like it's some stupid avant garde decision, and. uh Kevin Spacey was there that night. That's the little. <laughs> well, hey. I don't think he. He couldn't do anything for you now, anyway. I know, right? But yeah. but yeah. So you had so you had Kevin Spacey in your sixty seat house, uh, as circa two thousand. Yeah, he didn't and... come back. He didn't come back to see it as it was intended to. Well, whatever. We could tell. We could tell stories about Kevin Spacey, but um, yeah. but yeah, that's. I'm not that's, here for that. That's crazy. I mean, I mean, I've I've, I've heard the I've heard the. Uh, Everyone gets a like somebody from the back goes out and gives everybody a flashlight story, and the audience has flashlights, and they do the show from nothing but that. But I mean, like, they should have just stopped. They should have been like, yeah, "Ladies and gentlemen, I'm so sorry. Are you gonna get your money back? Come tomorrow." And then we would have moved. But instead, we're just doing I mean, broken shit on the ground, and and you're like, so so real quick before we move on from this, you did a substance specific performance of this on a different night when the lights were lights were functioning. Yes. So there. How much I I would drink six to eight beers easy I, uh, I mean, during the show. Look, man, that was your Frank. My Frank didn't drink as much. It was more like figuring it out and it was a little more performative. I had maybe what killed me was the shots. I think I probably am taking like four shots and then drinking the uh you know the other scotch. Uh I mean look, I was pretty I was pretty buzzed. Um and then you know when all the physicality happens, like I got a massive head rush and I'm like <laughs> like almost faked it. I couldn't uh, do it, man. I, I couldn't. Just, I couldn't. It was like friends. It was. I mean, it was a pretty full house, but it was all people who saw it and were like in on the joke. The guys wanted to do it. I couldn't. I couldn't let it happen. I mean, it was just like you should do it as a fundraiser. We should do it as a fundraiser. Bring back. Bring back. Bring the old. Get the band back together. And yeah, yeah. that would be good. But um, yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't bring myself to do it. I mean, like the that. fun thing about that is, I mean, it says it in the stage directions. Is like the, the, the characters never stop drinking. It. It's like that. Which you know, in my limited time in Pittsburgh, which I always enjoyed, it's a very similar culture. You know what I mean? Where it's like you just keep going. And that was great, and I mean another play, um, Small Engine. I mean uh, Rules of Seconds um, that, that that she wrote that we did that Dave was actually in. Uh, no, great. I know, dude, I gotta say, I had that was one of my best theatrical experiences. Was flying out to Pittsburgh, and it was magical seeing that show, and you know, just knowing you, but seeing the sort of you know, this incredible love of that theater. You guys did an amazing job. It was sort of like seeing the, the unplugged version of the play, which you guys yeah. did it on this stripped down way where the costumes and the blood were like triple a and the acting was triple a, but it was just super intimate. And I had an, it was like magical man. Cause it was like, I knew that play so well, they did it in LA and it was like, I loved that production. It's, it might be my favorite play I've ever written. And then, you know, I, I, as you know, I changed a lot for that production. So mm-hmm. it was so great to see it evolve. And then, you know, going to eat in that restaurant, walking through, having that badass cocktail and sitting there and just watching this fucking awesome Pittsburgh audience that was like 
rowdy and smart. It was like the best audience you could ever ask for. And I got to see it twice. And then walking out at uh, an intermission and it had snowed and seeing that flame belch out across the street. Dude, it was, it was, it's really was a beautiful uh, experience to remember. That's cool. I mean, I remember that. I also remember driving you to the airport the next morning, which was, uh, yeah. Which is a shocker for me because that, 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 that snow that's that snow wasn't that snow wasn't fun uh, at that no. point. Um, yeah, we like, were a great traveler either. Like in the sense of like, I want to be in the airplane. I just get an immense amount of anxiety to get on my plane on time. Most of it's irrational, right? But like you know, especially now that you have a kid, like you're away from your kids and your wife, and you just kind of like, what am I doing? I never go anywhere. I mean, go get a fucking convent, right? Like, right. I'm like, I don't know where I am. I'm like so hungover. <laughs> And I'm just, it's like five in the morning and there's like a fucking foot of snow. Yeah. And then you came and picked me up. I well, felt you got, so well, you got, well, you got, we, we, we got in. We I got in because I called at five in the morning. Well, no, it was fine. I answered the phone. I don't know how it happened. Cause we got, we got, you got in at like three 30 in the morning because yeah. we went to, we, we went from, uh, our bar. Then we took roadies down to the river. Then we went to Gooski's. Dave was there. Then we yeah. went to Gooski's and Polish Hill. Then that closed. Then we were there for an hour or so after that closed and then you got back around three or three, three thirty or four. My uh, my 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 girlfriend then my when our wife was like super pissed when I got no, she home. She was your wife then because she was pregnant. She was my that. wife. Then. Oh yeah, she was my wife then. Yeah, I'm so I'm, I was thinking the other one. So my, she was my wife then, and uh, she was not thrilled with me. But I think she got yeah. she was full of glee when the five o'clock call came that Ubers weren't running because there was so much so much snow hit within like a 20 minute period By the way, dude, i'm from new england it wasn't that much snow it was not that bad but you it, guys, the, the roads were pretty the roads were slippy they slippy. were slippy because it got it, it wasn't terrible i mean we they made it canceled school as a child where i grew up well it, the, the problem was it was only like there was only snow on the roads for like an hour and a half two hours right. but it came as a surprise so That's no, th- so they didn't pre-salt the roads. Nothing happened. So I got out and I was like, you know, sliding all over. But I mean, I'd, I I'd been asleep for an hour, so I'm white knuckling to pick you yeah. up. I'm like, all right, we got to get him there. Got you to the airport. Got home, laid down, and got up 15 minutes later for the day. It was like a goddamn Polano. Dave, did you know about that part of the story, Mansueto? I did. I did. I was just also we had that romantic moment uh, by the river. Yeah, Yeah, I was going to say we walked out by the river. It was like a full moon. And then you have that like theme park. I don't know if it's abandoned or not. I mean, it's it's awesome. It looks looks like it's It's cold. I mean, it was so cold. There are pictures that exist from that night. I don't have them right now. I was just looking for them. You don't know. I bought this fucking Fuji camera, like a really nice camera. Mm -hmm. And I took probably 50 pictures. And not a single one came out. I had like, you know, these cameras are so complicated. There's some button I press. So it's like all these pictures of you and Mansueto is like slightly blurry. It's like very avant-garde. So anyway, I, I'm glad to know you have photos because I, I don't have any. There's, there's, there's one or two that, that took. And I think Dave was doing like that lapsed lens thing where you have to hold still for five minutes to get yeah. like the shot. So he has one that took pretty in a, in a badass fashion. I just don't know. Where it is, I can't. Um, all I have is pictures of um, of my daughter on my phone, like five thousand pictures of. Her. Yeah, that's as a good dad should be. But that's it, man. So okay, so I mean, I know I don't want to keep you all night, but I'd love to. Fine, but uh, so what? Um, my wife's uh, birthday. It's no so big. so what do you what do you got? What do you got? Um, what do you have cooking now? Right now, what's uh, other than uh, homeschooling your your kids? But like, I mean, I've been I've been pretty lucky during COVID uh, to stay consistent. I mean, we're still doing a lot of development. I I completed two projects um you know that i was working on for a long time and then i'm about to go out and pitch a couple of things so i mean i'm you know i'm staying busy it's uh it's been again very weird because my year was sort of planned out to launch small engine and do all that stuff so it's been sort of hard to like what do you do and um you know creating stuff now we just, you know you don't know when it's going to be shot or when it's going to be made and, and it's just a weird environment but you know as a writer you can you can theoretically write under anything i mean it's been more challenging for sure because the kids you know look i need a routine i like to get up in the morning get the kids in my truck drop them off make a cup of coffee sit and know i have a very specific time to to work and the chaos of covid has made it a lot harder for for me to be as productive and you know, for my poor wife to kind of juggle all this bullshit. Yeah, I think it's the same for everybody, man. Yeah, no, it for sure is. Except you know some friends who don't have kids or who are single and they're and I'm like I mean 
Well, that's how I it is. I love my family. I love my kids, but it's a much different experience when uh, when you just don't have that. I, I agree. I agree fully. I mean, I'm, although I don't I'm, know what how it would have been if I was like single. You know what I mean? And like, I mean, people aren't dating. I don't think. Maybe they are. But. I mean, there's 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 probably an app called OK COVID, but um, like you got to take a test. Like instead of a breathalyzer, you got to show like your COVID test. Yeah, that's basically. I, I have no idea how that that's just working. Honestly, this is the first time I've thought of it. Um, like I've just been so like, uh, had like kind of like blinders on like kid, kid, kid. And then I've got this show here at night. I mean, we, we had, you know, we had a season of plays lined up. I was supposed to work on a couple of TV shows, a couple of other things, a couple of commercials, voiceovers, all that shit went away in like, in like two seconds. Well, look, I think this is going to pass. And I think mm -hmm. when it does, there's going to be a need for more content. I mean, they're not creating new stuff to any really profound degree. So someone like you as an actor or whatever, I think, mm. you know, there's going to be a lot of great opportunities. I, you know, I'm optimistic in the sense of those creative outlets that can stay in business, like hopefully bare bones, you know, when things come, people are going to want to have experiences, go to restaurants and do this stuff. Just who the fuck knows when that's going to happen. Oh, wait, there's, okay. uh, there's, there's a picture. All the pictures look drunk. Is that? All right, right, wait, go, well, that's, that's Alexi. Alexi. Drunk. That's Alexi. I don't even remember that. I've never seen this picture. That was Alexi probably talking to you about the 25 hour coffee that he was going to make you. He did. And in fact, Alexi was supposed to drive me to the airport and he, I couldn't get him to wake up. <laughs> That's what it was. I was like, knock on Alexi. I'm like knocking on the door. Yeah. So that yeah, didn't happen. Yeah. He didn't, he didn't happen. But yeah, that was a, again, that was a great night. Yeah, I, uh, I had a lot of fun there. That's good, man. Well, you got to come back uh, at some point. We got to figure out a way. To, man. I got to. Uh, you guys got to do another play. I either got to write something. Why don't you? Guys. Why don't you write something? We'll figure out a way to commission you for your downtime. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. I, mean, I don't know look, if we can. I'm, I don't I'm, know if we can afford I'm you for that. What's that? I don't know if we can afford you, but um, yeah, I'm in theater for the money. Of course you are. I can tell. You've got that sweet, sweet uh, studio right there. You're in. Yeah, theater. theater. And, and actually, it is, it is a I cool little I use for my plays that are published, and I like the check is like eleven dollars and seventy one cents. Are you whatever. serious? Yeah. I mean, what do you? What, I mean, let, let let me talk re real talk for a second here. What do you make off the off the rights from plays? I mean, how I mean, much I, goes to the house? And listen, how much most, goes again, to most of the plays that percentage. I percentage. I mean, something like Rules of Seconds, which is <clears throat> more ambitious and probably a bigger production that's not published. I, I haven't yet. I've been sort of holding out on the rights on that, mm -hmm. but the other plays, I smaller plays I have of which small under repair fits in that it's usually done by a smaller theater and okay. they're going to do like a, a, I don't know what they call it in Pittsburgh, but like a, you know, an equity waiver or whatever, okay. Non, yeah. okay. you know, a, a smaller production. So you're just not getting the, the Lord rates. Gotcha. I mean, I have way too many dick jokes usually in my plays to ever have a Lord production or something. So it ends up being it's like the bare bones in you know in in uh, in Chicago will do it or whatever right. you know the edgier gotcha. place that does it so you're just not gonna make a lot of money. gotcha cool well all right well I mean that's awesome dude I mean I want I want everybody to see um, maybe we get a small engine repair once once you get this thing I'm hoping this thing plays in movie theaters I hope, I'm hoping everything catches up hoping it gets out there maybe we have a screening uh, by that oh, point. I love that. I'm gonna try to. I gotta fix. I gotta. I gotta do some upgrades at the at the black box in 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 Braddock. But uh, we gotta figure yeah, out. Yeah, that would be yeah. so fun. <clears throat> um, I mean, we should talk. I, I mean, I'd love to do something like that. Um, right. Once I figure out what the hell to do with it. Yeah. Once uh, we can all. Once we can all, we can all be together again. Yeah. Or you can just like set this one of these screens up, and I'll just pretend I'm in the audience. Dude, I have a movie screen in there. Um, it was hidden during the set. I have a built-in. But like people 15... out of Pittsburgh wouldn't go. Like, if you had that, you're not going to get anybody to go in there and wear a mask. Oh, no, it's illegal. I mean, you can't. I mean, it's it's, oh, it's, it's illegal. It's, it was well, social distancing. You can't have x x amount of people. So if our if our theater sat 65, I mean, we did 75, and it was kind of tight. Right now, like COVID style, if we you did it like, like today, people. we get like 15 people max because we would basically and people would be on where the stage was that you saw. Are they doing uh, drive-ins out there? They're doing yeah, they they are. Uh, the City Theater Company is doing a drive-in, but they're not really doing theater. It's more of a like a community festival. So there's like a lot of different bands. There's jazz night. There's that. They're yeah. doing one. They're doing an adaptation of a show that's in their lineup, like a Frankenstein thing that they're going to be doing. So it's going to be some of it I mean, on screen, are, some of it live. You know, but they're awesome I, for doing. I, it. I'm sure you've seen Zoom readings of plays. Mm -hmm. They're 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 they kind of suck. It's just not the ideal way to do it, obviously. <clears throat> but um, 
look, man, theater is the oldest art form out there. It's going to come back. It ain't going away. Of course, it's just heartbreaking, uh, you know, God willing that, you know, um, people being away will, will realize what they've been missing. I mean, cause the thing I love the most about theater, especially going to like a bare bones is that <clears throat> I'm like literally breathing the same air as those actors and now it could kill you, but it's such a beautiful metaphor for being there. And you're like, they're yelling and it's vibrating the air right up against your face. I mean, that's fucking bro. Weird. You're like, you're like, you're like part of my brain here because these are the exact words that I've like early on in this. And I'm like my whole, my whole shtick when I'm talking about theater versus film is you're breathing the same air, right? That's the thing. And that, like, the first 15 years of my uh, theatrical life, I'm like, it's like organized sports. You know what I mean? Like, 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 so basically, I, I, I guess I could see why we get along. Yeah, exactly. But two cool, idiots. man. All right, well, man. Yeah, two cool. idiots. All right, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, there, there you go. That's a, that's a great photo right there. This was like at three in the morning. It's like two or three in the morning. So, Dave, Dave, you found a good one here, Dave. That was, that was all right. Oh. Well, I, hey, thank you so much. Uh, there, there's the hey, Monongahela there's River right there. Hey, thank and, you so uh, much. Love anything else fan. great anything else coming up in the future you want to come back and talk to us we'd love to have you um we can shoot the shit thank you so much john polano john is that i mean you, do you have like a like a writing website or anything like that that people if that people are looking to find no, you i don't think anyone would shit? ever hire me off of a writing website uh imdb so, or something you know I, I guess imdb whatever the fuck i don't do that uh, really um i don't either i'm just i, I just 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 one yeah I, I, you know i i, I don't have a website now all right. So um, Pete wants to talk campfires and retro vans and campers next time you come on. We can just talk uh, about that. I can talk about that all night. All right. Well, so cool. Well, thank you so much for coming on here, man. And good luck with everything. And hopefully I'll talk to you soon. All right, guys. Thank John you so Polano, much. John everybody. Thank you. Later, Thanks, man. That was awesome to have John here. Uh, somebody's popping in here. Dave, uh, let, let's wrap it up tonight. Um, what is uh, Who won the in-show uh, poll, guys? You know what? There must be a lot of musicians out there. At least five. I'm saying at least five. Oh, wow. This one was it a big <laughs> Boom! Pianos okay. and stuff, 57%. Eight votes on that. 43% for Hollywood music. I'm All right. a pianos and stuff guy, so I'm, I'm cool. I'm cool with this. So am I, but that's good. Okay, pianos and stuff is the victor. Let's tell him what the weekend overnight uh, multiple poll is, Dave. Dave's like, no, I'm not doing this. He's got to give me three seconds to get to the button. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry. We, we 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 ran long. We this ran one's long. hot. It's, this one's hot too. So. What's, what is what is it? What's what's the what's the big uh, music? Who? Man, it's you, Patrick Jordan. You, Patrick Jordan. Come on, the overnight vote poll. It's gonna happen all weekend long. Pittsburgh Diesel Institute commercial that nobody is actually sure if it actually existed as a commercial. I don't know that we actually clarify that it is in fact a commercial or it just maybe exists in Patrick Jordan's brain. But though it's fitting then that the Pittsburgh Diesel Institute goes against Patrick Jordan in Batman. Patrick Jordan in friggin' Batman. Overnight poll to get the pgh.com slash vote. Just got to do it. Just got to make it happen. We'll get, let's get the numbers up there, man. We can beat a thousand this time. Where's our hacker at, baby? Let's do this. Oh, my God. I, 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 I tell you what, Pete. Christ. All right. Um, all right. I mean, I have nothing else to say. I'm speechless. Pete, you've outdone yourself with the with the gif. My favorite is that last one. <laughs> that last wow. little clutch shot. Jesus Christ. What did you do? I mean, that is there's that looked like it took some time. It did. I spent a lot of time. I spent all of like seven minutes making that gif. Well, well, thank you all very much. Uh, thank you to uh, thank you to John Polano. Uh, thank you to Natalie Besavenga uh, for doing that, uh, for her fantastic five minutes with. Everybody check out, uh, you know, Hicksburg. What else you guys got before we wind this wind this crazy-ass week down? Well, I could talk about the modifications I'm going to make to my camper van. Nah, we can do that. that. We can do that on Tuesday. We'll, we'll do that on Tuesday. I'm also going to be working on a deck. If you want to talk so about check this deck. out, Dave. I think we it's time to, to wind, it, wind it down and uh, send it home unless Pete has anything else to say. Um, well, you know, um, I'm really into this modification. Yeah, man. Black Lives Matter. <laughs> Thank you all. Take care of each other. Stay safe. Um, reflect. Remember, 19 years goes by pretty fast. Um, we're going to get through this too. 
just like we did the other thing. So um, uh, take care of each other. Be cool. Wear a mask. Uh, keep your distance. Wash your hands. And uh, we will see you Wednesday at 8 o'clock. We've got a great week of shows lined up already. Thank you all very much for another great week. Thank you. <laughs>